Hi everyone, good evening. My name is Niharika Ghadke and I welcome you all to a new session as a part of YLCC's Legal Careerathon series where we have an expert every week to guide you all. Today we have with us Ms. Divya Malcolm, ma'am. Welcome ma'am and thank you so much for joining. Ma'am is here to guide us on career as a real estate lawyer. Ma'am has been a partner at Kochar & Co after which she has started her own practice under the head, under the head of Malcolm & Malcolm where she has had a varied experience, experience and expertise in corporate areas and litigation. Uh, if the time permits, we shall have the audience's questions at the end of the session. So I request the audience members to pin down their questions in the chat box. So ma'am, please give us some insights into your career trajectory. Also, our audience would like to know what drove your interest in the real estate domain and what excites you the most about this field? Insights into my trajectory. I can tell you one thing. When you are a student and you, you read um, your Transfer of Property Act, when you read the Rent Control Act, when you read the lands, you know, acts related to agricultural lands, everything looks very boring to tell you the truth. And it is not until you are able to apply all your knowledge, all the acts and the statutes that you have read to practical situations, uh, that's when the fun starts. And that can be as soon as you graduate, as soon as you get your law degree, the, the fun bit starts. Because all along you have been answering questions, you have been writing theses, now you're able to put all that knowledge to some use. However, 10 or 15 years down the line, you have, you, you get insights into your sector. And that is a different kind of joy altogether. That's when you are able to come up with views on statues. That's when you are able to understand the scheme of things. And your first principles, your first, you should know your first principles in law like the back of your hand. 15 years down the line, you will realize that everything is about appreciating those very first principles in law. So now, so if you ask me uh, how I feel at this stage, I feel elated and there is a quiet satisfaction about uh, knowing your subject and knowing it well. I came up across a wonderful uh, quote recently that what you, how you spend your time in college determines how you will spend the rest of your career, the rest of your working life, the rest of your professional life. Okay. All right, ma'am. So what are the key responsibilities of a real estate lawyer? And do you feel there is a growing demand for the real estate lawyers in India at present? Oh, yes. I mean, there's a huge demand for uh, real estate lawyers in India. Uh, I'll tell you why. Real estate laws, you need to understand uh, both the, uh, the law, the statute, and uh, real estate laws can be very peculiar. So real estate laws can be very peculiar. At the same time, you need to, you know, there are something called revenue records. Now these revenue records are kept, are maintained by the government and are usually kept in the vernacular. So you have to depend on a lot of uh, advocates and other professionals working at the grassroots level. Now what happens is there's a mismatch of talent. People who know the law, who are well versed with the law, are not able to read uh, revenue records or records maintained by the government in the vernacular. Now that there is, you know, gone are the days when we were a third world country. We are, we are, you know, we are, um, we, we as a country are prospering. We have a, um, so, and real estate is an expensive proposition. No house in, in India costs less than 30 lakh rupees. So you're, we are talking about Muslim and Oh, lovely. Now I can see everybody. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. You are completely audible. Okay. Now let's make it a bit 
interactive. I would like to ask one of you, Saksham, you tell me, do you think there's a scope? Um, what is your your idea of real estate? Uh, what is your what do you understand from a real estate lawyer? You're a lawyer yourself. Why didn't you give a small introduction about yourself? Uh, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, I'm I'm a first year law student, and uh, for answering uh, about your question, that uh, what uh, what I think about the real estate laws, uh, I think in that uh, in the perspective, like uh, we 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 are focusing on industrialization or money making power and Skill India Foundation or other any other method for which uh, we are uh, improve, empowering youngsters for invest in india so there is a huge scope and uh, since 2015 i think if i am not wrong that uh, our government has given the um, right to the females in the ancestral property as well so there is a huge scope but uh, i think uh, like uh, you, as you have clearly mentioned that uh, there is a huge uh, dilemma like a uh, we uh, a real estate lawyer has to read many so, more Sakshim, I'm so sorry, but I am having difficulty hearing you. Uh, but what I understand is your idea of real estate law is somebody, uh, you know, there's a lot of scope according to in the real estate laws because um, for a real estate practitioner, because we are becoming increasingly industrialized. And that is right. If you're a conglomerate, you need a dedicated real estate team for uh, your expansion plans, you may decide to set up a new plant. And how do you set up a new plant? You need somebody to advise you uh, your, um, your project costs maybe something like 100 crores. But before you commit yourself to such a large investment, you would first like to know whether the land is available, is legally available whether there'll be any issues once you put up your factory plant, because you don't want to put up a factory plant and later on realize that you can't operate it. So yes, there's a huge scope uh, in uh, for real estate lawyers and most companies have a dedicated real estate team. Banks, banks have a dedicated real estate team, project finance, not funds. We get a lot of funds uh, from uh, you know places like Mauritius. Mauritius is a tax haven for as far as India is concerned. So these kind of funds also have a dedicated real estate team. If you if you are thinking of a career in a law firm, now uh, you know typically a tier one law firm has a corporate very strong corporate practice area, but Every day, there is not a merger and acquisition uh, happening. However, your real estate team, you'll realize, is busy round the clock because every day there is some sort of transaction or the other which is happening. You know, people tend to think that uh, real estate practice area just consists of litigation or the RERA, Real Estate Regulation and Development Act. Well, that's a very narrow view of things. I'll tell you why. There is a very vast scope on the non-litigation side. Now, this consists of maybe title due diligence. This consists of documentation. Real estate documents are very peculiar. You know, your MOUs, your term sheet, your agreements, leases, leave and license agreement, conveyances. These are very peculiar documents. And therefore, and these the real estate documentation, which in, uh, requires special training. Hence, there's a, the scope for uh, real estate lawyers is, is immense. Uh, Ma'am, can we move on to the next question then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are the uh, legal areas of expertise which are necessary for a real estate lawyer to succeed? Well, uh, for any lawyer to succeed, you should be ready to read, 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 read day in and day out and read as much as you can. Um, have your, as I said, Transfer of Property Act is very basic. You will be using it all the time. You'll be, you know, brushing up your concepts uh, all the time. Then your Stamp Act. See, Stamp Act is a fiscal act. You cannot structure your uh, transaction correctly unless you understand the Stamp Act inside out. Most states, most states have their own individual Stamp Act, but 
all the stamp acts of every state are more or less based on the Indian stamp act. So I would advise everybody to, and also have a little bit of multidisciplinary approach. And when you're in college, don't think that I'm going to be a real estate lawyer, so I don't care what the income tax laws are like. Because you might have to structure your transaction bearing, mind, bearing in mind the income tax laws. So I would advise everybody to be thorough with the Stamp Act, the Registration Act, various uh, laws regarding agricultural lands. Each state has, the, has its own set of special uh, laws, or statutes, regulations governing real estate. Be thorough with those last laws. Of course, you have the Real Estate Regulation and Development Act. You have the Rent Act. Each state has its own Rent Act. You need to be thorough with the Rent Act. However, as I said, have a multidisciplinary uh, approach. So if you're working on a transaction, try and understand what the accountancy firm is trying to tell you, what the chartered accountant is trying to tell you. Try and understand what the architects are trying to tell you. Try and understand the zoning laws. See, it's not now, for example, right from Kanyakumari all the way to Gujarat, there is a strip of land which has been declared as eco-sensitive zone. There may be nothing right with the, wrong with the title of the owner. However, you may not be able to build to scale on these lands, on lands notified as eco-sensitive zone. If tomorrow your, your company, your approach by a company which is into chemicals, you know, the, the main business of the company is uh, manufacture of paints. Now, paints are categorized as uh, heavy chemical industries. You cannot set up a chemical plant anywhere. Definitely, you cannot set up a factory in a residential zone. Now, supposing you intend to have a construct a bungalow, you cannot construct a bungalow in, uh, say, a land reserve in a reserved land, in a land reserved for wildlife purposes. You cannot touch those kind of lands. Now, regarding construction how to read plans, how to understand plans. All these aspects you can understand only if you interact closely with architects. So have a multidisciplinary approach to your subject. Yes. Right. Along the same lines, ma'am, what particular skill set should students try to incorporate in themselves if they are aiming to become a real estate lawyer? What particular skill sets? <laughs> Hmm. Uh, hard work and an ability to read. You should be able to read. You should be able to read things which are not very interesting because real estate laws are not drafted like your, uh, you know, like a John Grisham novel. You, we tend to read novels. How many novels have you, which novel are you reading right now, Niharika? Ma'am, I'm uh, currently reading Agatha Christie. I'm more ah. on the fiction side. And which one? Uh, which uh, book Murder, of, Murder in the Orient Express. Orient Express. Have you seen the movie? No, I haven't. I tend to read first before watching the movie. Well, great. I have. Uh, I was. I was in school when I read Mousetrap, and till date, she writes wonderfully. And uh, yes, that is one of the things you should do. You must read classics. See, the advantage of reading classics, the advantage of reading, say, an Agatha Christie is that you pick up her incredible style and you develop a temperament to read, uh, to read things over a period of, when I say, um, you know, everybody can read a grand, John Grisham, but everybody cannot read Charles Dickens. So right. reading classics give you, uh, give you a sort of temperament, uh, which is uh, which you need to, to appreciate real estate laws. Right. Now, and I, uh, when I was your age, I loved Oscar Wilde. I mean, I, I was a big fan of Oscar Wilde. Till that I can quote him on any given occasion. You'll be able to- All right. Sure you, 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 Niharika, you, you are able to write better than your peers 
which other book are you reading there are other uh, I would... yes who is who is your favorite author my favorite author uh, now i can think of dan brown at the moment but uh, i am also reading uh, the biography of steve jobs by walter isaacson okay okay i i is is he the same uh, uh, also who uh, who wrote he the, is more into writing biographies of people did he write last steve jobs biography book walter isaacson yes so i have read uh, his uh, steve jobs biography and it, it really reads like a Um, you know, like a James Bond uh, movie script. There's not a boring moment in that book. Not at all, ma'am. But not even I, for a minute. As I said, when you read a classic, it 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 dwells on you. The the it it teaches you how to develop a scheme, which is very important. You see, increasingly, I come across documents which. only the lawyers who have drafted the document can understand what the document is trying to say you should be able to sift the grain from the chaff as a lawyer pick up what is essential to your transaction record what is important you should be able to understand so what what we refer to as recitals you should be able to you know appreciate the nuances of the transaction people tend to record even irrelevant things in the uh, in the agreement what happens when the parties start fighting all that irrelevant stuff comes to haunt you because that irrelevant stuff goes against you so you should be able to understand what should be recorded as background what should be recorded as a promise what is the consideration which you know you need to record the consideration up up front what are the conditions precedent what are the for example if a permission of the collector is required see if there are certain lands which cannot be acquired without the permission of the collector when it should come to you naturally this is a condition precedent what should be a condition subsequent and what is a dispute resolution clause what is what should be your miscellaneous clauses so when you read you you will start when you read any book any article try and understand try and decipher the scheme of things the plot that the author is trying to evolve because that will give you a knack to develop your own plots to develop your own schemes I right. hope I have answered your question satisfactorily. Yes, ma'am. So I'm moving on to the next question. You served as a partner at Kochar and Co, and now are successfully running your own law firm. What does an employer or law firm partner look for in a candidate while hiring? And what role does the previous deals, which are closed by the candidates, play during the process, especially for a lateral hiring role? Okay, so if you're talking about hiring freshers, to tell you the truth, I don't expect freshers to know the real estate laws the way, you know, say somebody with a, a post qualification experience of five years or six years or ten years would know. From freshers, all we expect are good research skills, because research is something which takes a lot of time, and usually, uh, you know, people, partners. people heading the firm we don't have that sort of time on our hands see your biggest enemy is time and especially as far as uh, non litigation practice is concerned there is there are no adjournments there is no tomorrow there is no everything has to be uh, you know done completed done as of yesterday so when we look at freshers we expect them to be very good at uh, research we expect them to be diligent um these are the and good english so these are the three things that we uh, look for as far as uh, pressures are concerned also as i said your first principles in law must be uh, in place but if you are looking at uh, somebody who already has little bit of transactional experience then we would try and gauge what you have understood from that transaction 
So whether, uh, you know, you can uh, draft similar kind of documents, whether you can carry out another assignment of a similar nature. And if you have been, you know, if, if you have been indifferent in your previous transaction, that shows. Everybody should be invested in everything that they are. Take ownership of your assignments. Only then will you be able to grow in the profession. And in interviews, we can easily guess who has been indifferent, just taking you know, uh, instructions from the senior and doing a very clerical sort of work and who has really, uh, you know, acquired knowledge and brought home certain takeaways from a transaction. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the very precise answer, ma'am. Moving on to the next question. How important do you think are negotiation skills for the real estate sector if a law student or professional wants to enter the sector? Negotiation skills are very important. As I said, um, you know, real estate sector, a real estate vertical, real estate practice area has grown as a practice area by itself. So we are no longer talking about uh, a, a practice area where, uh, you know, when I started my career, say 20 years ago, people thought if you're handling real estate litigation, then that's good enough. You, would, you can call yourself a real estate lawyer. And, and why so? Because most real estate litigation is about property. I mean, sorry, most litigation is about property. People spar over property most of the times. Today, a real estate lawyer is expected to negotiate and finalize documents round the clock, day in, day out. The minute you close your due diligence report, the very next step is to start drafting the start finalizing the uh, agreement because the drafts are exchanged while the due diligence is underway. Negotiations require certain soft skills and therefore in, in, in tier one law firms, you will notice that the team which, is, uh, which handles litigation is, is usually uh, quite different from the team which handles negotiations and transactional work because these two practice areas demand different type of uh, interpersonal skills. You cannot always see litigation is an adversarial environment. Your, uh, your opponent is going to, is never going to cooperate with you. Your opponent is always going to be at loggerheads with you, which is not true of transactional work. Sometimes in transactional work, you have to Make sure that the transaction does not fall through, that everybody works towards a common goal. Everybody, you know, everybody's concerns are answered. So, uh, in a transactional, uh, sorry, in a transactional matter, you would expect it to be more patient. You cannot just get up, throw a fit and walk out of the room. That's a complete no-no. I've never done that. I've never had a, a case where my transaction has fallen through. So yes. Going on to the next question. Ma'am, students tend to think that the internships teach better than academics. So could you please tell us how important, how much importance should a student give to academics and internships and competitions, publications, and other extracurricular activities to be precise? See, everything is important. Everything is important. Everything counts. Your internship would be meaningless unless your academics, uh, you know, you're good at your academics. Competitions too are important. They teach you how to be competitive. That's the entire idea of competitions. If you participate in moot court, you learn the art of thinking on your feet. Publications are extremely important, especially if you're thinking of uh, uh, approaching foreign universities. So, uh, you know, foreign universities uh, attach a very uh, great uh, they, uh, weight to publications. And remember, in our field, there is you cannot uh, advertise. So how do you how do you promote yourself? The only way you can you can be respected or you can be well known is by writing. And if you start early, so much so the better. 
So every every aspect has its own role to play. Academics is as important as internship, and as I said that uh, internships are again as important as competitions, publications, etc. The important thing is you should be a student all along. Every minute you learn something the whole day long. Learn something from everything that you are doing. It may be something as simple as watching television. Now, if you, I'm very fond of watching debates. If you watch uh, Shashi Tharoor's debates, for example, you will realize that his language is beautiful because his language is so uh, rich. He can talk effortlessly and seamlessly on any topic. You will also notice that I think he has done his PhD in history or something. He, he can talk seamlessly on the uh, colonization of India. And his homework is good. He's very thorough with his homework. He's very thorough with his facts and figures. That is something you can imbibe as a lawyer. So it may be, you may feel that watching a uh, debate, Shashi Tharoor's debate has nothing to do with law, but you may be extremely mistaken because they may be, you may learn a lot more from watching his debates than maybe reading a book so whatever you do, um, you just make sure that you are able to you are able to use it uh, in your uh, profession. Yes. Next question. Right. At Malcolm and Malcolm Advocates, you also deal with other practice areas than just real estate. So could you please brief us about your responsibilities while handling your own practice? And how do you manage your mental health as a law firm founder? To tell you the truth, your, your mental health is uh, a lot better when you, uh, you know, when you set up your own practice because it is something you love doing. Everybody wants to have his own practice, has his own baby. So, in fact, uh, you have to tell yourself not to overload your team because not everybody shares your passion to work on Saturdays, Sundays, late nights till midnight, get up at six in the morning again and be at your computer. So there's nothing more uh, pleasurable than being on your own, the sense of independence uh, yeah, and, and limitless opportunities. When you have your own firm, you realize that the opportunities are endless. And uh, of course there is, um, you know, a lot of your time is saved because um, usually uh, law firms, you know, there are a lot of these internal requirements you have to, fill in a lot of returns, you have to, so all that, if you have your own law firm, all that time is saved and you are able to uh, give back to the profession more effectively and enjoy the profession a lot more. Uh, before beginning your own practice, you worked with Kochar & Co as a partner for a brief period. So could you please tell us what, what work you dealt with back then and what part were you interested in the most? When you when you specialize in a particular sector, uh, typically in law firm, the way law firms are structured these days, you have to specialize in a particular area. And uh, when you specialize in your particular area, that specialization stays with you. The the nature, in fact, I do a lot more challenging work now, as I said, because the opportunities are endless. Uh, I can shift between verticals. I can do corporate law. I can do uh, litigation. So, but my 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 core competency is real estate, and that's what I enjoy doing the most. So, the nature of work. In, in fact, as I said, this year we gave an opinion on tribal lands. This year we gave an opinion on eco-sensitive zones. This year we gave an opinion on IT ITS policy. We had. Uh, we had a construction company come to us with a very interesting uh, matter. So yes, and remember when you have your own law firm, the level of your responsibility is a lot greater. You cannot, uh, people uh, look, look to you and, and uh, to provide answers and you cannot just uh, you know wash your hands of responsibilities. So the, the level of responsibility when, when you have your own uh, law firm, is a lot greater when when you when you work for somebody else in in, in somebody else's uh, law firm. Right. But whatever wherever you are, make sure that you are doing your very best 
uh, you may be working in a tier one law firm, be as invested because when you start your own law firm, you will realize that all that years of accumulated knowledge, uh, you know, will help you. You'll be able to go forward only if you, uh, if you have accumulated knowledge during your earlier years. Right. So ma'am, like you also mentioned right now, drafting is a very important part of our profession. And since your drafting experience includes a holistic range of documentation, what things do you think every student should keep in mind before drafting a document during internships, especially in the real estate domain? Uh, you know, have your basic concepts in place. That is very important. Often, uh, and the, I have given uh, presentations on only on documentation and you know in this on those presentations you will notice that i've spoken about how people goof up right from title clause so there is no aspect of documentation which is and uh, which can be taken for granted so but at internship stage what i would like you to do is get familiar with the style of you know with the documentation uh, with the a drafting style, get familiar with the drafting language. Drafting language, you understand, is a lot different from uh, transactional drafting, is a lot different from, say, writing a brief. When you draft an affidavit or when you draft a plaint, you want to get the judge involved in your matter. You want to tell the judge, yes, I am a victim, I deserve a particular relief, and you build up your case accordingly. So have, you would rather, you know, when you're drafting, you would have the prayers in your mind first. But you have to build up a case. You have to tell the, convince the judge that I'm in the right. Now, transactional drafting, you have to understand the transaction, what your client wants from the transaction. Try and also understand the client. Just don't sit at your computer and start typing. Try and understand the client's business. That is very important. And the purpose for which he's entering into this transaction, that should come out clearly. The purpose, the underlying purpose of the transaction, consideration, how the consideration uh, will be exchanged or part, that should come out clearly. Now, real estate transaction has, has very, uh, you know, it proceeds in stages. First is a letter of intent. Which is, uh, you know, which is something of a handshake. Next is a memorandum of understanding on an agreement, which is something more of a handshake. You know, you are each party is committing to something, so you are actually making commitments when you enter into an agreement. A sale deed or a vesting document or a lease deed is the vesting document where you actually acquire rights. So you should be able to see these different phases you know, from the document that you are preparing, where is this document leading you to? So at internship, as I said, read as much as you can and and see and I try and understand the interplay of practical situations with the law that you are studying at college. Right. Um, do you think the real estate sector is evolving rapidly? And what predictions do you have for the upcoming non-traditional rules in this sector for law students? Oh, yes, it is evolving. I mean, as I said, uh, there, there, there was a time 20, 30 years ago, nobody considered real estate, uh, you know, as a, as a separate vertical. People would either confuse it with a litigation practice or with a corporate practice. Today, we are talking about real estate as a separate vertical. So it has come a long way. And the reason why it has come a long way is because we have real estate companies with very strong bottom lines. So they need committed real estate teams. <coughs> we have uh, uh, in, in law firms, we have, uh, as I said, your uh, m &A team may have a transaction once in a while, but uh, your, uh, your real estate team is, is loaded with work. And as I said, uh, there is a there's a disconnect between 
between students, between uh, you know professionals who are able to understand, uh, read the revenue records in the vernacular, and who are able to understand the uh, statutes and the special laws governing the real estate sector. So somebody that that gap has yet, is yet to be bridged. What we expect from pressures and the you know lawyers who are interested in real estate today that five years down the line they will help us bridge this gap. And the, yeah. <laughs> All right, ma'am. Uh, since you have already answered the next question, I will just move on to the next slide. Uh, so ma'am, what is your advice for final year law students who are willing to explore a career in the real estate law? I would, uh, you know, people uh, tend to join corporates as soon as they get their LLB degree. Nothing, nothing can, uh, nothing can uh, compensate for, um, for the kind of education you get being in practice. So don't uh, try and join a corporate right away. I would still advise everybody if, if uh, you know, if, if, uh, if money is not a very important consideration, if job stability is not a very important consideration for you, then please, please get a taste of, um, of uh, legal practice. And then maybe a couple of years down the line, you may decide to join a corporate, be it a real estate firm, be it a bank, be it a fund. However, please go to courts. Courts will teach you how to interpret laws. Courts will teach you how to draft correctly. Please uh, be with a law firm. It will teach you how to how to do things on your own, how to be independent, so that when you start your own law firm, you're not dependent on somebody. So my advice to all the freshers is don't join a corporate right away. Corporates can give you a wonderful exposure, but you need to evolve as a lawyer before joining a corporate. So ma'am, how has this sector recovered from the COVID-19 pandemic and has it affected the opportunities for young lawyers? And could you please brief us about the current scenario? Uh, to tell you the truth, uh, uh, I started my uh, you know, law firm uh, during the pandemic. And I started my law firm in uh, September and by March we had crossed 100 acres. So sometimes I tend to think that maybe the pandemic hit other sectors more than it hit real estate sectors. Suddenly the growth in tier two city picked up. A lot of projects are now being, like, uh, large projects are now being planned for tier two cities. So I would say that, uh, you know, perhaps real estate has come out stronger out of uh, the pandemic than, uh, uh, than any other sector. There were pre-existing -exist uh, sort of illnesses in the real estate sector before the pandemic. And during the pandemic, I would say whoever, who's, whosoever survived the pandemic came out stronger. Also, Ma'am, could you be brief about the current scenario? It depends. It depends uh, uh, when you talk about change, uh, changing verticals. Now, ch changing verticals is always a, a difficult position at any because you invest there is a thumb rule in order to call yourself a specialist uh, they say you must give something like 10 10000 hours 10000 hours is a lot of hours now if you decide supposing you specialize in um, arbitration and you are given 10000 hours mm -hmm. to dispute resolution and arbitration when you shift from that to say real estate, you have to start from scratch. So there is a trade-off. There's no doubt a trade-off. If you decide to join a real estate sector, you won't be able to join at the same level from your previous job. So, so shifting from, uh, which is true of any change, shifting from one vertical to another vertical has its own challenges. Right. And as I said, real estate is a very peculiar subject. There are special at every stage. Every state has its own laws. So, yeah.
we can take questions from the audience now yes would anyone be willing to uh, unmute themselves or they can even type it out in the chat box i will read it out uh, is anyone trying to speak uh, yes ma'am yes uh ma'am i do have a question like uh, uh in uh, while answering the first uh, first question you have mentioned about the real estate vernaculars i uh, just have a doubt like uh, are you mentioning the bhulek documentation of the government of india or any other documents which is used in their real estate purpose documents certain notifications are both in english as well as in hindi the vernacular documents that i'm talking about are revenue records you know records maintained by uh, say your talati records maintained by a patwari at your gram level so those are in um, uh, so if you are in say punjab those are maintained in gurmukhi if you are in maharashtra those are maintained in marathi if you are in gujarat those records are maintained in gujarati but they are very important records because they tell you everything about uh, the land they may not confer title but uh, they they give you they tell you inside about uh, inside out about uh, the particular parcel of uh, land you are dealing with whether there is uh, you know whether there is uh, it's acquired by the state government for putting up an industrial project whether there is uh, an a uh, road acquisition uh, notice whether it's an e it falls in eco sensitive zone whether it falls in some other special zone whether it's a forest area whether it's a tribal area all that information you can you can gather whether the property taxes have been paid whether uh, there is a attachment of uh, you know uh, gst attachment on the land because if you don't pay your gst dues then the uh, gst authorities have the power to attach your assets <laughs> i hope that answers your question saksham uh, so i will read out the other question now i am in my final year and i want to try out the real estate sector but i have never done any internships in this field uh, so how should i pursue my goal to be a real estate lawyer see um, you know you, you need not attach too much premium to your internship uh, either if you are really interested in real estate laws as i said after you get your llp degree the the world is uh, open to you you can do what you want but to begin with when you are as a student uh, study law diligently at least uh, you know get uh, read the latest uh, supreme court the latest high court judgments regarding your particular chosen field what interests you read the uh, read real estate related laws as i said even practicing professionals they are uh, they have difficulty advising on uh, stamp laws stamp act so read the stamp act get your bearings right get your first principles of law uh, in, in in order so when we right. when we hire the freshers we just what we look at is as i said how diligent they are and whether their first principles in law are in place right so that should also answer the other question which asks for what law firms expect from an intern to extend a pre placement offer so would you have anything extra to add to whatever you have mentioned yes i think that we have answered many times it was part of the for the slide too yes right ma'am so ma'am any final advice for the audience members no it's it's always i would like to thank uh, while cc for giving me the opportunity to interact with students is always wonderful to interact with students and as i said there's there's a dot of talent in the real estate sector i'm sorry for the uh, background noise i'm at uh, this wonderful club called the catholic gymkhana in mumbai so any if any one of you happen to be in bombay please do stop by it's a wonderful place and uh, unfortunately i think uh, there's some background noise today which is my bad luck we usually it is at around this time it is uh, fairly quiet that was not a problem at all well i must say niharika it was wonderful interacting with you and i'm so glad that uh, you know you are still reading you and i'm so glad to know you're reading classics and you're reading um and that's that's i mean i i picked up walter isaacson when steve jobs had just passed away because it, it was 
uh, it was his life was very inspirational so you know when when uh, when all people like i interact with young students we also get to know uh, what are the what is the trend which way things are headed so it's always uh, a learning even for us to be on uh, on platforms students uh, you know platforms floated by students and all the very best to you thank you so much ma'am tell me what else are you reading because you have really got me interested Just last week i finished reading uh, the seven husbands of evelyn hugo so i'm more on the fiction side i try reading non fiction but it is just hard for me to cope up with non fiction now even I, i draw a lot of inspiration from biographies and as um, the only uh, the only thing which got me reading the biography was uh, if we look at the media then we always get a part view so some people it is like some people half of the people hate steve jobs and half of the people love steve jobs so reading a biography can give me i believe that it should it should give me a lot of uh, light into his real life and it is at, at the end i believe it is up to the author because the, whatever he believes he is going to make us believe that so i was trying to find if i could find anything uh, through which he was trying to get biased or anything but uh, we cannot help it so that is the thing uh, i remember reading uh, gandhi ji's autobiography by louis fisher as a child and uh, it, it it's wonderful how louis fisher you know thought about uh, gandhi ji he he started his biography by talking about gandhi ji's death and the kind of reaction that broke from everybody world over and why non violence is important to us why ahimsa is important to us because especially with the war going on in russia and ukraine today every almost every other country has nuclear capabilities you may not have the largest nuclear arsenal but even one nuclear bomb is sufficient to destroy your enemy and it is and if you want to negotiate your uh, you know negotiate anything as as a developed country or uh, as a sovereign then war is not an answer and that's why I'm, ahimsa is important it teaches you how to how to get what you want without a fight so yes right. and that's what i learned from louis fisher's biography uh, on gandhi ji wonderful book uh, if you get the time yes. we will definitely check it out man very well written too see and be very uh, careful of uh, reading the right kind of stuff you know there are a lot of authors almost everybody uh, writes a novel these days make sure that the uh, the the also you have picked up the english is nice and crisp because in where you be you you will subconsciously you, you will pick up what you are reading you will pick up his style you will pick up his expressions so it's very important for all the students all of us to read the right stuff right I thank you everyone for joining in. Also, thank you so much, ma'am, for taking out time and rescheduling this meeting on a Saturday evening, especially. And I believe I'm speaking for everyone here when I say that uh, the everyone had a proper calculation of the opportunity cost when they decided to join the session on a Saturday. So, thank you so much, everyone, and thank you so much, ma'am, for the very very insightful session. Well, thank you so I much. I wish you a great weekend ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.